Hello, I'm Doug, stand-up physicist. The oldest unsolved problem in physics is to unify gravity and EM. Albert Einstein spent 30 years of his life trying to do the task, but he failed. Why try so hard? Well, the classical laws for the two are very similar. Newton's law of gravity is an inverse square law. Imagine a hollow sphere. You're attracted to this sphere because of gravity. Now, if you were to get inside the sphere, you would feel nothing. Well, actually, you get attracted to this side and you get attracted to that side, but it exactly cancels. This is the calling card of an inverse square law. Ben Franklin did many experiments with electricity. In one, he had a metal cup and he looked inside and saw no electric field. He told his buddy, Joseph the Frenchman Priestley, about this result. And Priestley realized that was the calling card of an inverse square law. So we know that gravity and EM have very similar force laws. In modern theories, we start from a Lagrange density. A Lagrange density is everything that can happen inside a box. By taking different derivatives of this thing, you can figure out fields and momentum and energy. The Lagrange density for gravity and for EM are very different from one another. One varies the metric for gravity and the four potential for EM, and those just aren't the same animal. So my efforts to unify gravity and EM to solve this long-standing riddle I, what I do is I start from the Lagrange density for EM and then try to generalize it just enough so that it can do the work of gravity. So let's start with the most successful field theory we have, that for light. This is the Lagrange density for EM. Like charges repel, and opposite charges attract. Why do they do that? Well, this charge coupling term here has the same sign as the field strength tensor contraction. That field strength tensor is anti-symmetric. Well, it's like that because there is this minus sign in there that throws away information for the sole purpose of making the tensor anti-symmetric. A connection is a way of characterizing space-time curvature. The exterior derivative used in the tensor is in no way dependent on the connection. So you could be in wildly curved space-time, and yet the, the exterior derivative remains the same. Because like charges repel, we are, when we quantize this theory, we will need the spin one field. Now I'm going to try to generalize this Lagrange density. This is the gravity and EM, or GEM, Lagrange density. Opposite charges still repel, 
but they repel a little bit less due to inertia. Opposite charges still attract, and they attract a little bit more due to inertia. Now, this little bit more and a little bit less are really a little bit. If for an electron, they have both electric charge and mass. If you measure those in exactly the same units, oh, get back up, then what we find is that the mass is 17 orders of magnitude smaller than the, the electric charge, which we only know to 10 significant digits, so it's some 10 million times too small to see. But it's there, at least uh, we can calculate it. All right. The, um, the reason that there is a positive and a negative charge uh, attraction is because there are two signs for those two different current densities. And we now have a field strength tensor that is asymmetric. That's composed of an anti-symmetric part to do the work of EM and a symmetric part to do the work of gravity. I think of the symmetric tensor as being the average amount of change for the potential, and the anti-symmetric tensor as being the deviation from that average amount. Clearly those two are independent, and yet still depend on one fundamental for potential. This time, a covariant derivative is used. A covariant derivative does depend on the connection. And so this is going to put a constraint on what the con uh, connection can be. And finally, since we have opposite charges repelling, we need a spin one field or an odd field. And because we also have attractive, uh, so sorry, opposite charge is actually attracting, we also need a spin two field. Now we're going to generate the field equations in the standard way by just burying the, act, uh, the four potential. Here is the gem field equations. I think of this as a four-dimensional slinky with two modes to do the work of gravity and two modes to do the work of EM. Over here you see the field equations for the theory that look remarkably similar to the, Einz, to the Maxwell equations in the Lorentz gauge except that the current density is a little smaller due to the mass or inertial current. I've written out the first of the four field equations next to it that I call General Gauss's Law. Now, if the mass density is very, very tiny, which is usually the case, then we get Gauss's Law, 4 EM. If, on the other hand, we have an electrically neutral uh, physical situation, then we have Newton's law of gravity. Now, with these two laws, we can do a huge amount of physics. So that is good news. The bad news comes from critics like this, who say, Bah! This is boring! The... the background metric is fixed, it is flat, I, I have no interest, fixed, flat, yuck. Well, the truth is, working with the fixed, flat background is a good thing. We want our theory to do that. What the critic is missing is a key diffeomorphism 
in the Lagrange density between the potential and the metric. The idea is that a different combination of potential and metric can describe exactly the same physical situation. Yes, a, a interesting metric, uh, an interesting potential, boring metric works, but we might be able to find the opposite. Interesting metric, boring potential. In general relativity, there's a diffeomorphism between mass and the metric. And you can solve for the metric exactly given a particular mass distribution. But there might be a different combination of metric and mass that describes exactly the same thing up to a diffeomorphism. For my gem proposal, there is a diffeomorphism between the potential and the metric. So that we know, uh, let's, let's consider a simple example, a point charge. We know that a one over R potential and an utterly flat metric can solve the description of that sort of field. But there might be a boring potential that has an interesting dynamic metric. And this final term here, the divergence of the connection, is, may constrain what, uh, what the metric can be. Now I work with a torsion-free connection that is metric compatible. So there is a unique metric for the connection. And that way I might be able to solve that differential equation and find an interesting metric. And here is the gem metric. This solves the, the row equaling the divergence of the Christoffel symbol. Now, a metric is the distance between there then and here now. This metric is dynamic because it depends on both the mass m and the distance r. Now, if those, if coefficients are very, very tiny, which is usually the case, then those exponentials will almost be equal to one. Now they're not quite one, and that's very important. Because we can characterize a metric with per 10 parameterized post-Newtonian coefficients. And the 10 coefficients for this metric are exactly the same as those for the Schwarzschild metric in isotropic coordinates. That's very important because it means this metric passes many tests. It passes a test for the weak equivalence principle. That is about the inertial and the gravitational mass. It passes tests for the strong equivalence principle which is about the passive and the active gravitational masses. And it passes tests for weak gravitational fields, things like light bending around the sun and the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. But at second order parameterized post-Newtonian accuracy, the predictions are different. For light bending around the sun, this metric predicts 0.8 micro arc seconds more bending than does general relativity and the Schwarzschild metric. So that is very important because it means this experiment, this metric can be confirmed or rejected entirely on uh, experimental grounds. At this time, we only can measure bending to 150 micro arc seconds, 
so we're going to need more work, but at least it should be possible. A third class of tests involve strong fields. In particular, the emission of energy from binary stars due to gravity waves. That has been shown to depend on quadrupole moments, not on dipoles. Now, my proposal is completely conservative. There's no background field to store any energy. So if we are looking at a completely isolated source, it cannot change its center of mass, which is what's needed to make a dipole. So all it can do is change its shape, which leaves its center of mass at the same spot and that can create a wave. And to characterize a change in shape, you use a quadrupole moment. So the only gravitational waves for an isolated source this theory can ha generate is with a quadrupole. It's consistent with experimental results. Now, any theory must get along seamlessly with quantum mechanics. How is my proposal going to do? Well, I'm hopeful. I think that what happens is that there's a spin one field, which is transverse and does the work of EM. And there's a spin two field, which is both longitudinal and scalar, or having to do with the, uh, the size of things. And that's, as I say, spin two. And together they characterize this four-dimensional wave. I've calculated the canonical momentum and none of those terms are equal to zero. That's very important if you want to then go on and create operators for the energy and the three momentum. Now, this four-dimensional wave has already been characterized and is in nearly all graduate quantum field theory books in this section for gupta bleuler quantization. What I have to change is the interpretation. There is a trans, two transverse modes that do the work of EM with a spin one field. But they then they say a spin one field that is a scalar mode of emission runs into a serious technical problem. It would suggest that there, are, there could be a negative energy density and that makes no sense. They're right on this. But what I do is the scalar and the longitudinal modes are for a spin two field. That is always attractive and that eliminates the negative energy problem. All right, does my theory do anything dramatic? Anything that's a showstopper? Well, we try and teach an old law a new direction. There's a big problem in physics, and that is explaining the rotation profile of a spiral galaxy. We can look at those stars and see that their mass is falling off with a beautiful exponential. And we can see that the velocity eventually just goes flat as a pancake. Newton's law does not have a solution like this. There is a constant velocity solution. However, it requires that the mass fall off much more slowly than exponentially. I have a few observations. This clearly requires a force because momentum is changing. According to the chain rule, a force is a change in momentum 
and therefore it is the mass times the change in velocity plus the velocity times a change in mass. Now the MA term, very famous term, is about mass times the change in velocity. Well, velocity is not changing. That's not going to explain the rotation profile. The other term is about constant velocity and a change in mass. And that's exactly what we're trying to describe. Now, I've actually derived this force law. But you can also justify this expression on purely dimensional grounds. Newton's law is about the mass density rho, the velocity v, and the distance r, all caused by the source mass m. And I have used those three, rho, v, and r, to create a constant velocity term with the right units. Now for one particular galaxy, uh, NGC 3198, I have tested this hypothesis. If when the radial uh, term becomes unimportant, then you can solve this equation exactly. And there the velocity is absolutely flat and the mass density falls off exponentially. So the curves, the shape of the curves, match exactly what they need to do. The exponent for that exponential, using just the data from the galaxy, which would be the, the source mass, the distances involved, and the velocity, the terminal velocity that it, that it ended up with, was within 6%. So I'm quite hopeful for this approach. All right. So what have we accomplished? Well, we're trying to solve the oldest big riddle in all of physics, unifying gravity and light. We used the, the first type of Lagrange density anyone would guess. And we did so using a few modern concepts, such as uh, the covariant derivative and spin. We got the field equations in absolutely the standard kind of way, which looks kind of like something we're very familiar with, with a little bit less due to inertia. And that sounds reasonable. But more importantly, when we looked at the details, there was a way to get a dynamic metric out of such field equations. And that metric is consistent with our current tests of general relativity, or gravity, I should say. And it is also experimentally testable. And so that's very promising. The structure of it looks like it will be easy to quantize because it's a linear theory that is consistent with the weak and the strong equivalence principle. And finally, we might be able to solve a big riddle out there, which is why do galaxies rotate the way you do, they do. So I think we may have found the gem that Einstein was looking for. Thank you very much.
grade he gave him was way unfair And all the professors, they laugh about it and they wish him well The guys in the class are all just jealous as hell Math prof rock star Help me! I am so confused! What does it all mean? <laughs> I hope there's not gonna be a quiz!